three, two, one. Derek Bringen, you are the head of healthcare for Clydesdale and Yorkshire Bank, which is soon to be Virgin Money for Business. Welcome. Thank you. Good Pleasure day, to be sure. here. It's, uh, it's great to have you on board. So, um, uh, I know that you uh, effectively started the healthcare division for Clydesdale and Yorkshire Bank, um, following some time with RBS. Um, but where did your interest in health and social care kind of originate from, if you uh, if you like? Uh, well, I suppose interestingly, I was born in a social care setting, mm -hmm. um, which you wouldn't think much of at the time, but it's had an impact on my life, I guess, since then. Mm -hmm. um, so I went through normal school life, ended up working in a bank just out of school mm -hmm. as a office boy um, and worked up through various divisions and ranks and various places and ended up um, volunteering to do healthcare mm -hmm. at RBS, which uh, nobody else actually wanted to do. And I was the last man in, so I was given the honour uh, and really enjoyed it mm -hmm. and found there was actually quite a lot in there that was really interesting. Mm. And uh, so it went from there. Got you, got you, got you. So, and um, I guess you've kind of touched upon this on on some level. But why is what you do so important to you personally? I think. Well, I think if you've had a social care experience, and I would imagine most people will have at some point, but certainly from early years, then it does leave sort of impacts on you, and you're on a bit of a journey with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's always been something I've been quite close to. Mm -hmm. And I've also had quite an affinity with grandparents, adopted grandparents, people like that. So I've always had a lot of time for the elderly people. Mm -hmm. I think I've learned more from elderly people than probably a lot of people that I've mixed with. So I've got a lot of time and respect for them. So I've got a kind of interest in making sure that both ends of the spectrum are properly treated, I guess, and have a decent outcome when lots of people don't. Mm. It's, um, it's not amazing in any way, shape or form, but uh, funnily enough, over seven, eight, nine, ten plus decades worth of life, you tend to accumulate quite a lot of wisdom, don't you? So there's a, there's a lot to be learned from the, uh, from the older generation for, uh, for sure. Yeah, so. absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about, um, so what, what's the bank doing from the perspective of uh, supporting health and social care? So we've, we've my, my fortunate position, we've been able to come into that organisation and look at what they were doing and see how we could perhaps do something to support that sector mm. over a period of time. So it's been a very interesting journey, sort of starting from fairly basic principles and then trying to grow that. Mm -hmm. So we've really looked at um, how that marketplace operates from the other side, the mm -hmm. other side of the table, if you like. Sure. What are the challenges? What are the things that people are aspiring to do? What are the blockages in trying to do some of those things? Mm -hmm. Some of that would be financially related and uh, you know what would we do as an organization to try and come up with some kind of solutions to help drive that part of the business forward so i think we've done quite a lot of work over a fairly short period of time but we've spent a lot of time exploring and understanding the sector mm -hmm. the people in it and the staff and the drivers behind the businesses to then think about what is it we can do mm -hmm. and we've structured ourselves off the back of that so some of the things we do are born very much from what we're hearing from that side sure rather than what we might assume as bankers mm -hmm. people that want sure that makes a lot of sense there are a couple of initiatives that you've that you've mentioned before would you care to just kind of run through a couple of the uh, i guess quite some of them are quite pioneering and just different ways of approaching things that um mm. Clydesdale's doing at the moment so we've we work with a lot of services for adults with learning disabilities and um, mm. complex needs, sure. uh, physical and mental. And for that community, inclusion is a real challenge. Mm -hmm. and, and you only need to spend a lot of time with these people to see some of the challenges that, that they face that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. And actually access to banking and completing a transaction is, you know, beyond comprehension. Mm -hmm. So we were asked to explore whether we could come up with something that would perhaps assist them with doing something fairly straightforward mm -hmm. but would mean such a lot to have empowerment over your own financial mm -hmm. matters. So we spent quite a bit of time developing and we still are developing what we think is a, a reasonably successful pilot so far on providing that population of people with a bank account. Sure. 
which allows them to carry out transactions as you and I would mm -hmm. using some technology sure. and gives them the freedom and a sense of purpose mm -hmm. about doing a financial transaction. Mm -hmm. The feedback we've had from the parents and the guardians has been, you know, tremendous. Mm -hmm. um, one parent said that it was really a kind of land-breaking thing to watch his son going into W. H. Smith and I think he bought a pen. Mm -hmm. And that was monumental. But things that we would take for granted, but so important Absolutely. for... Absolutely. Uh, yeah, sure. So the solution's not been easy, mm -hmm. but there's something we could develop there. Uh, the other thing we've looked at is the, the issues with staffing and some of the staffing challenges in the sector that we know about. But what what does that mean to the people at that end of it? Mm. So, you know, meeting with staff and understanding what their priorities are and some of the challenges they may have, which might not be in the workplace, but they mm. might be in their home life. And we undertook a survey which suggested a lot of people have financial worries, financial concerns. Sure at a moment in time or on a, over a period of time, but they go to work with those. Sure. So when they arrive at the workplace, they're already not in a great frame of mind. Because they've got financial worries Stuff in the back going of their on. head. Yeah, yeah. But there's really nowhere to go with that because you'd have to have very close friends to be able to reveal a financial situation. Mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't maybe want your family to know about a financial issue. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of embarrassment and stuff like that as well. Nor would you maybe want to tell an employer. Mm. So we um, explored this around, across a whole range of sectors, but financial well-being and mm. employee well-being became something we thought this is really, really important. Sure. So we've developed a sort of service where we will provide employee well-being financial counselling, I suppose you could call it, mm. but we'll do it in the workplace. We'll do it in an area where members of staff can meet with our teams discreetly or certainly intimate they want to do that. Mm. Um, and we'll do that at the start with a sort of broad presentation to staff so they can understand what's available to them. Um, feedback so far, staff have found it has been very helpful in some cases, a bit of a lifeline for some. Mm. Employers have said that staff have actually found it a very welcome opportunity mm. that their employer has made available to them. Mm. Uh, so, so again, just try to think, what could we do at the other side of the desk mm -hmm. that means a difference to people that are in health and social care? I sure. guess. And there's um, there's quite a lot of charity work alongside um, some of the uh, some of the other innovations, isn't there? Yeah, I think. Well, Clydesdale Yorkshire Bank has always had charitable interests close at its heart, mm -hmm. and uh, we've been involved in. Sleep in the Park initiatives for the homeless. We've done, you know, a few things for various charities around about mental health and other issues that are quite prevalent. Um, and you mentioned the link up with with buying Virgin Money mm -hmm. as a business and integrating that. And Virgin Money uh, itself mm -hmm. has got a lot of charitable background, mm -hmm. Virgin Giving and some of these other things that they do as initiatives. So sure. we will probably continue in the same vein with that strand. Mm -hmm. Sure, no, that makes sense. What, and why do you think it is so important for the bank to get involved in the, in, in the sector and kind of supporting the greater good, if you like? It's such a huge contrib contributor to the economy and day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just thinking on the way here, how many people have I had sort of close relationship with who have had some requirement for social care mm -hmm. or health services in the last 12 months? Mm -hmm. And it's quite a big list. Yeah, um, okay. Never mind just going to see your GP, but mm. you know some of the other things that people have had to rely on, um, and that can be any family, uh, mm. any workplace. Mm. So it's a really huge part of everybody's life day to day. Um, it's going to increase in terms of demand and the amount of people that will need services in some respect. Sure. So it's a fundamental basic of our society actually, mm -hmm. and creates a big amount of employment mm -hmm. across the UK. So as a bank with interest in both personal banking and all the things that brings, but mm -hmm. also in the business context, supporting businesses that are in that particular sector market, then we think it's hugely important mm -hmm. um, for us to be supporting it. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. And 
so I know quite a lot of people that bank with Clydesdale in Yorkshire from a from a business perspective, um, and that's that's very very intentional. Again, obviously, that's what you've been spearheading for the last. How, when did when was it you started with? Nine and a half years with more hair. Nine and a half years with more hair. So <laughs> almost a decade, right? Yeah, okay, got well, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> so the um, uh, that's obviously what you've been spearheading. That's where um, uh, that's where you've kind of put your commitment and things like that. So what have you what have you managed to achieve from like you've got to differentiate yourself? Kind of what um, what have you done to differentiate yourself? Kind of over that period of time. Yeah, well, I suppose we've found out through um, just continuing this journey about what works and what doesn't mm -hmm. it, it's not as straightforward as you might have imagined uh, it's certainly not been as straightforward as I would imagine but that's that's the challenge that's the mm. that's the uh, that's the drive mm. um, we've got a, a small market share of a big big market mm -hmm. and we have to position ourselves to be able to um, you know do well within that environment mm -hmm. not easy we've really built it on the people um, I know Robert Colgower sat, I think, in this very chair and yeah, said, indeed. surround yourself with people who are more intelligent than yourself. Mm -hmm. And he's absolutely right. Because if you, if you bring in the right people who have the right talent and the right ambition and also the passion for the sector that you're working in, mm -hmm. then you can start to build really strong relationships. Mm -hmm. And that's with professionals, but also with some of the organisations that support health and social care mm -hmm. and really be engaged and really get under the skin of what that is all about. Mm -hmm. So we actually spent a lot of time doing that before we really started doing anything on the business development in terms of sure. lending side. So that was, that was investment, mm -hmm. that was people investment and that was where I think we've got a really strong focus as a group of people within the bank mm -hmm. specialising that we cover everything. I mean the guy the guys and girls have all got something that they're really passionate about. Mm -hmm. So some will be more into looked after children, some will be into young adults, mental health, some will be into physical disability types mm -hmm. of businesses, others will be into elderly care, maybe dementia special because there'll be some link, mm -hmm. there'll be some kind of connection. Um, and that's where I think We've we've really focused our interests mm -hmm. because we we will um, we'll never get to the size of you know, the larger traditional banks, mm -hmm. but we certainly can do quite a bit with um, with that approach that we have. Sure, it's interesting what you say about kind of having that personal connection within the mm -hmm. uh, within the team and things like that. It's yeah. ultimately it's going to mo motivate you, isn't it? If you've got a personal con connection to any part of health and social care, it's going to be part of the driving force and part of people's why their purpose around why they do what they do on a on a day-to-day -day basis which that's it's really really powerful i'd like to think so mm -hmm. i'd like to think you can identify it as well because if you share that yourself mm -hmm. you'd like to think you can see it in other people mm -hmm. so i'm very blessed with the people that i have that work uh, with me some have been with me for quite a long time some have joined us mm -hmm. and and they've aspired to come in and do what it is we do mm -hmm. they want exposure to that, sure. um, which would suggest to me it's, it's a rewarding thing to do as well. Mm. So there's a lot of positives come out of it. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a challenging market, it's a challenging environment sure. to, to be lending into, but mm -hmm. you know we've slowly and steadily just grown our exposure to the market across a whole lot of segments, sure. and we've deliberately done that. Mm -hmm. So we've not chased uh, growing something overnight. Mm -hmm. We've been quite careful to plot how we do that, mm -hmm. which has put us in reasonable stead, I would say. Mm -hmm. But actually it's more enjoyable because mm -hmm. you have to spend the, the time actually invested in it to, mm -hmm. to have the success. Making it sustainable most of the time. Yeah, yeah, true. That's true. Yep. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. So. Um, I know there's a lot going on with Clydesdale and Yorkshire Bank. Uh, what with the uh, with the acquisition of, of Virgin Money. So, tell me a little bit around. So, what does that ultimately? What does that mean? It, it's fairly significant, um, certainly from from our side, mm. because we're seeing uh, we're seeing a, a very well recognised business in, in Virgin, mm -hmm. in the Virgin Money brand. 
being brought into uh, a very traditional and heritage organisation of Glasgow Yorkshire Bank, mm-hmm. and uh, I wouldn't, you know, almost a marriage of the two. And how does that actually work together? So, what, what, what are the links between those two businesses? But equally, what can e- when e- what can each learn from each other? Mm-hmm. So certainly, there's a lot of excitement about how we're doing that because the the culture of Virgin as a business is quite exciting and quite vibrant mm-hmm. compared to traditional. Uh, banking mm-hmm. environment and I've been in a few so I can speak from a number of banks that I've worked in that you know what I see there compared to what I've been used to is quite exciting mm-hmm. and it's a different approach a different spin sure. on that whole marketing and, and branding and concept and how you look after people within it mm-hmm. so we're, we're really embracing that mm-hmm. uh, to try and just really reshape what we're very good at on the Clydesdale Yorkshire side but how we can actually manage, manage to successfully. Mm. And, and the Virgin money business is very much a retail-focused business with quite a lot of tech sure. behind it. We've invested heavily in tech recently as well and mm. continue to do so. But we've got the business platform that Virgin Money don't have. So mm. the sector specialism is something of, attra- of attraction to the Virgin Money staff mm. uh, who are really interested in what we do, as are we in what they do. So... There's a lot of good nuggets within the whole culture piece, mm-hmm. and then there's the brand, sure, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, which is, I would say, most people know the brand. So to be able to buy that mm-hmm. brand, and then you know, we would look to leverage off that. Then that's that's a fairly significant thing Big for time. us. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I mean, that was Richard Branson's whole thing, wasn't it? It's it's getting industries that could do a shaking being shaken up and, yeah. and then shaking them up and doing yeah. it doing it a different way, looking at things from a different perspective and things, and that's why, what's he worth? £3.8 billion and he's got 178 companies or whatever it is, but he's he's done that because he's he's managed to, to realise that there's there's an awful lot of um, industry sectors, whatever, that, that, that could be done better. So just having mm. that outside perspective and just thinking, okay, so how can we challenge the status quo? How can we disrupt things in a positive way to make them just more applicable to, to yeah. what's going on in the world today? Um, so for Clydesdale in Yorkshire to, to get the best of the kind of the the, the heritage of the uh, of the um, uh, of the both Clydesdale and Yorkshire, and then to integrate that into a, a new and exciting, very entrepreneurial brand and things like that, I think people will buy into a lot. It'd be interesting as well from a, I think entrepreneurs. Um, the people that you'll ultimately be, be lending to, who you're helping them with their with their growth journeys and things like that, I think there's probably going to be quite a lot of appreciation for Branson uh, as well as a, as a person and his own personal brand. So being able to connect with a bank who has that kind of those ethos and values of entrepreneurialism and doing exciting things in the world, I think people will connect with that um, on a uh, on a um, quite a fundamental basis as well. I would I would expect so. I think. Certainly, I feel that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there's quite a lot of really good stories and testimonies within that whole Virgin business. If you if you explore it, mm-hmm. all the different strands of it, uh, and you're right, it's about reshaping something and looking at something in a completely different way, which is what we're being asked to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it can be painful because you know somebody's asking you, well, why do you do that, mm-hmm. and why would you do it that way? Um, and you have to think about that, mm. and then you have to think about actually, is that the right way to do something? Sure, um, could yeah. we do that in a different manner? Mm. So let's have a look at that. Um, let's not just paint it red and say, right, that's a virgin thing now. Mm-hmm. Let, let's actually say, well, what, what does that need to be to actually meet the aspiration of this business mm. and our whole culture and our whole ethos and how our approach to the to the marketplace? What, what does that need to do? So we're we're really in the middle of all that, and it's. It's very interesting, it's very exciting. Mm. And, and and we're in a good place as a team and as a sector specialist group to actually be part of that journey mm. um, at the forefront of it to try and see if we can you know, find something within that for our own team and benefit. Mm. Uh, and I think we will, actually, sure. I'll be honest, I think we will. Mm. Yeah. What what do, what do you think it means specifically for the for the health team, healthcare team? Like, what would you what would you hope and expect from kind of once everything the uh, the, the the kind of the rebrand and things has uh, has ultimately gone gone through? Where do you see things kind of coming together for the for you and the healthcare team in the future? Um, free flights. Free flights. <laughs> no, <Boom. laughs> no, no, possibly not. Uh, 
the brand's really, really strong. So we, Clydesdale Yorkshire Bank is a good, it's a good brand. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong, it's a very strong brand, but I think it's quite limited in its overall market penetration. Mm-hmm. And the Virgin brand is a lot more recognisable in areas we're probably not very dominant in. Mm-hmm. So we can see huge advantage and be able to use that to to drive growth. Mm-hmm. Um, we also think it allows us to go into new areas where we haven't been able to before or haven't thought about before sure. because there'll be a new way of thinking about things mm. and access to the Virgin legacy group companies through sort of tie-ups we might have that we can then offer benefits to customers and to the bank itself. Mm. That'll be the other part of it that we can kind of leverage on as well. So sure. I think there's quite an interesting opportunity for us under that umbrella whereas before I think we've done very well with the Clydesdale Yorkshire heritage brands mm. but the, this is the opportunity yeah yeah where can we go next it's an exciting time for, for you and the bank it, it, it is it is it is I mean you can get a bit nervous about it but it would be wrong not to be mm. but you just embrace it and say right what do we do here to to take this forward and speak to customers at the same time and say, well, what does that mean to you? Mm. What does that feel like? Sure. Because uh, that's hugely important. And we've already had those kind of conversations and feedbacks and you know, we're understanding those and analysing those and getting to understand people's aspirations, expectations. And it's uh, it's a good exercise. Mm. Yeah, no, I can uh, I can imagine because there's so many different stakeholders in what you're doing, mm. both internally and uh, and externally. But um, but no, it sounds uh, sounds exciting. I look forward to the big launch at some point in the uh, in the not too distant future. So the big launch probably 2020. There'll be 2020. something. So good yeah. stuff. It's going to be a big year in uh, in many ways. So, it will. Um, so you've been involved in the sector for for a long time now. What what do you think the biggest changes that you've seen since you've been uh, operating in this world? Probably technology and the more investment than we've seen historically. Mm-hmm. There seems to be a lot more capital available in the sector over the last uh, 13 or 14 years that I've been involved. Sure. Which have driven a lot of new initiatives. So the self-funder care home was probably not something you would see a, an awful lot of um, you know, mm-hmm. in my RBS days. Sure. But now we're seeing more and more of that investment and the quality therefore is getting more and more at higher quality but more and more um, dedicated and specific focus on where how what does it look like mm-hmm. so that's a that's a big market change and then you've got the local authority funded care which has probably struggled a lot safe to say mm-hmm. and where we see most of the stress and some of the fallouts in the sector are around about the implications of that. Staffing is a big issue and increasingly seen as one, whereas I didn't probably hear as much noise about that maybe back then. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think technology is now starting to get, get pace, mm-hmm. whereas we've been quite slow to adopt technology as, sure. a, as an industry. Mm-hmm which we're now realising we can't continue to do mm. because of all the things that are causing interference. So we are seeing more technology coming into a lot of the developments we do, mm. but also a lot of bespoke devel- uh, systems we put into existing operations mm. for more efficient you know, staff, um, staff in and outs. Mm. Uh, staff interactions, mm. care plans, sure. uh, acoustic monitoring, all these different things that are all coming into play. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that will continue to gather pace, which is which is something we need to keep on top of as well to understand what, what is happening in there. Mm-hmm. So that that's, I've definitely seen, there's been a huge move towards that. I'd also say the sector is probably more collaborative. Mm-hmm. I think there's more connectivity between people in the sector, between professionals and you know, the providers, um, trade associations, trade bodies. I think there's more of a link between all these groups. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot more dialogue. There seems to be a lot more activity around about education 
sharing of best practice. Sure. Um, and a lot of collaboration, which I think is very positive. Mm. And I think that can only be a good thing if it's steered in the right direction. Definitely, yeah. And I think the sector needed that because people were in sort of isolated or were in a bit of a silo and didn't see that there was a, a wider market out there that they could probably learn from. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a significant change for the better, but we need to continue to support that to mm -hmm. make sure it actually does stay maintained. I think that's one thing that both of us are quite passionate about, kind of fueling, mm -hmm. creating environments where, I mean, that was part of the reason for the, for the podcast to be able to, um, I'm blessed in as much as I spend a lot of time with people from all sorts of different kind of walks of life and within the within the sector and just having interesting conversations just to be able to say okay so this is this is something from a uh, a charity that supports the sector this is from a supply sector from a banking sector from a legal perspective or perspective or or, or any type of perspective because there's there's so much that can be can be learnt ultimately there's I think from from my experience certainly and albeit I've only been involved in the sector for a relatively short space of time the I've seen more and more collaboration more people trying to push for collaboration because I think there's a, a hunger or a thirst to to try and work out okay so how can we shape the sector what are going to be the things that are going to help um, have a positive impact around the the delivery of care the life experience for the residents the sustainability of the businesses that are looking after the people in the in the first place the technology that's going to get involved in kind of the bigger picture type type stuff and long may it continue i mean ultimately we we're, we're doing an all right job of it now but we probably still could be doing an awful lot an awful lot better so um yeah no that's really interesting thank you um what what would you say the um i guess the, the key drivers are and trends around transactions from a from a banking perspective the there are lots of capital providers out in the marketplace so I think from a, a borrower's perspective or an investment pr perspective there's probably a huge choice they've all got their own individual aims and and desires of how they want to do that mm -hmm. but you have to see through all that and understand which one's the right one for you um, and there are lots of different ways of, of, of approaching that. So it's quite, it can be quite confusing, I think, in terms of a provider looking for a financial solution. Mm -hmm. So the, the challenge is, is being able to deliver something that's workable, tangible, realistic, affordable, mm -hmm. but also to be in a position where you are both working together to come up with the right solution which doesn't overstretch that business sure. and put it into a position where it could ultimately, with matters out with its control, mm -hmm. come back to cause trouble and problems. Mm -hmm. So over leverage, I think, is a problem that we've seen historically, which is, is just too much borrowing being put into vehicles. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just part of the economic cycle. That's what happens. We have boom and bust. Mm -hmm. um, so it's being able to understand the impacts of bust when you're boom, mm. and and I think we we you know there's a lot of there's a lot of work been done on what that needs to look like and how that should be should be uh, monitored. Mm -hmm. But that's been one of the biggest problems I think historically in legacy care businesses that have found difficulty is that they've probably had a too much borrowing mm -hmm. that it's very difficult to. To unravel. Sure. Um, so we have to be conscious of that. We also have to be conscious of interest rates are really, really low. Mm. So you can access capital at a very cheap um, per se mm. compared to the past when we've had really high interest rates. So will that continue? If you get used to working in an environment where that's the norm, Mm -hmm. And that then changes. Yeah. Through no reason, any of us have maybe had any impact on. Mm. So a, a macroeconomic cycle, and the interest margins go up. Um, that suddenly increases your your, your overhead. Mm. And I think you can get a bit blasé about not building that into how you model your business going forward because you need to think about the scenarios scenario setting yeah and uh, I think that's where 
you know, we, we approach things very much with a look at look what happens if mm-hmm. and actually sitting down and say, well, if this happened, this is what we, this would do for you. Mm-hmm. What would that mean for you if you were in the business you're in today? Um, is that workable? Mm-hmm. And that, that, that's a sort of tipping point. Uh, and I think there's a responsibility in everybody to try and you know, manage that mm-hmm. because it's easy to, to chase the chase the, 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 the bull market. Of course. I guess if uh, Mark Carney and his team start making decisions around um, putting the interest rates up and things like that, even if it's a relatively small amount, if you're yep. operating on a re- relatively thin margin and you've got plenty of debt, then that could be a very could be a, a, a very big problem for people overnight, which if you haven't, as you say, if you haven't factored that into, into your financial modelling and things like that, you might become unstuck. So if you'd like to think that the operators are going to be thinking thinking these things to themselves anyway, but having a friendly banker to be able to help them ask those questions and uh, challenge them on their uh, on their forecasts and things like that is obviously very, very important. So I think it is, and I think, that's the, I think that is the, listen, the people that we're dealing with know how to run care businesses they know how to uh, manage people in the best way to look after vulnerable children and adults mm-hmm. in the best way possible. And and that's what their expertise is in. Mm-hmm. But you need some financial oversight and you want a collaborative financial oversight or mm-hmm. input or guidance. And I know you've got CQC market oversight committees and things, but that's a different approach. Mm-hmm. You know, We would like to think you're working in partnership you're part of that management team, in effect, because you're actually you're actually in control of that financial aspect of the business. So you should really work hand in hand, hand in glove. You should be coll- collectively um, supporting each other mm. in terms of what that information is telling you or what that needs to be, mm. because that's the way you both succeed. Mm. Uh, and, and a degree of caution is never a miss when it's that. Because at the end of the day, if you're operating in the care sector, you know, caution and, and uh, regulatory oversight and, and all the things that can trip you up mm-hmm. is a minefield. Of course. That probably makes the financial bit quite a small thing that, compared to all that, but actually it's it's still a fundamental risk. Mm-hmm. And if you think about a debt probably in the sector per se in the UK, it'll be a large number. Mm-hmm. Um, it'll, it'll, be a large, it'll be a large number. So we're all big stakeholders in in this as well. Sure. Making sure that that uh, debt is managed correctly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So um, many economists many economists are um, uh, basically saying, look, we're at the end of, end of an 11-year bull market. Mm. Um, what happens if the tide turns? So we've seen multiples in terms of values in the sector rising. Uh, and that, that's a prime asset that I've mentioned previously. We're now seeing multiples uh, double digit, but going into the 10s, 11s, 12s, mm-hmm. maybe slightly higher. That's into sort of quite aggressive territory in terms of values. Mm-hmm. That drives a vendor expectation as to what they might think their business is worth mm-hmm. in that type of marketplace. Sure. And it means a buyer's probably going to pay more to get the right thing that they want because of that push mm. uh, and that and that's that's a, like an economic factor but the issue would be if you put debt and layer that into that or some financial instrument layer into that mm. and you and you you chase that multiple and, and drive it what happens if, it, if we turn into the opposite and the bull markets turn into the in a bear markets and then what will happen is those multiples will shrink, mm. and they and they'll shrink quite quickly. Yeah, because the confidence will go. Mm. So all those things then impact in terms of the value. So mm. I've actually paid too much for something now. Yeah, um, and I've actually borrowed too much mm. to acquire it. Yeah, and the only winner is the person who's been fortunate enough to sell it, who's managed to get out when things were were good. Mm-hmm. The implications of that are quite significant because you've eroded value, you've then got a leverage issue, you've probably got a lot of covenant challenges around Mm -hmm. about loan to value and ability to service debt. Mm -hmm. But it's also very difficult to to get out of that because if if values are continuing to fall, uh, it's very difficult to recover that. Mm -hmm. 
So unless you're robust in terms of your financial management and you manage your cash really, really well, mm -hmm. to be able to ride through that and overcome the cycle, then you'll see the fallouts that we've seen historically. Sure. Um, and that and that's the difficulty. So you know, all the banks are trying to win business. So how do you do that? You know, does somebody push the envelope right out and say, right, we're going to push this, and we're going to go to that multiple or that amount of loan to value? Mm -hmm. And that might win them a bit of market share, which is which is which is what they wanted to achieve. But it does I do think it puts you in a vulnerable position. Sure. Are they leaving themselves and the business exposed ultimately? Possibly. Mm -hmm. um, but for some people that's what they want. They want that, so they'll take that mm -hmm. that approach. So it's it's a very difficult balance uh, to get that right. And uh, as I said to you earlier, it, it's like a game of chess. Mm -hmm. I mean you, you really are trying to work out a lot of different factors that are beyond your control to make sure that you're not overexposing the sector and yourselves to something mm. that you don't have control over. So we're probably at a stage in the market where I think values are at a level which um, I don't know if they'll go much further and because of the uncertainty we've got politically. Mm. Certainly foreign investments kind of slowing up because of uh, exchange rate issues. Mm. But there's still a lot of good business being done. Mm. Um, people are still building things. Um, which we are, you know, doing a lot of, and people are still transacting. So um, there are still transactions going on that are still achievable and doable. Mm. So, as a sector, what do you think we do well, and where do you think we've got the biggest opportunities to improve? What do we do well? If, if you look at actually, if you look at the regulatory piece. All we hear about is the bads, the, the, the you know the, the, the really inadequates and all the, the fallouts from all that. But actually, if you look at the statistics from CQC and the care inspectorate and the inspectorate in Wales, statistically, the, the care generally is is good. Mm -hmm. I think in the UK, or better. I think the UK, I think it's eighty six percent, something it's, along those it's lines. Roughly um, about eighty six percent. Yeah, good or good or outstanding, which is just the line share. That's a great place and there's a lot be. of people in care, so. So a lot of people are getting good quality care. Mm -hmm. uh, so clearly there are good things going on there. I think there are now moves to try and share best practice. Mm -hmm. This is why we do this and this is how we do it and mm -hmm. share that with somebody else so they can then experience and learn from that. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to take people around other people's businesses now. Mm -hmm. You know, God forbid. But could I show for example, um, could I show somebody a piece of tech that somebody else has got mm -hmm. that might actually allow them to see how something works mm -hmm. or doesn't work? Yeah, yeah. We're now doing that and people are now quite happy to show people mm -hmm. or talk about things. So that's really good as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as a organisational group of people that work in the sector, we're all getting more communicative Mm -hmm. We're all sharing best practice. We're all talking about themes. You know, we're doing workshops, we're doing seminars, we're contributing to the dialogue and the debate. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. And I think everybody should continue <clears> to embrace <throat> that. So that's all good. Uh, what we're not so good at. I think one of the issues I see is that we don't have a collective sort of single prong spearhead about social care and the inadequacies of it compared to say investment in the NHS mm -hmm. and that imbalance of distribution of that resource because sure. the green papers, goodness knows where it is, mm -hmm. um, certainly not been mentioned in any manifesto I've heard. I haven't heard anything of myself. Late. So mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a thing. So who's actually driving at the front of, of that spearheaded prong into the government and, and administration saying this is this is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And I think we probably have a number of people doing that, a number of organisations doing that in different shapes and sizes and guises. And I'm not sure we're getting that whole message across in a single mm -hmm. spear. And, and actually I think organisations like myself and others, professionals, we should be aligned to that too. Mm because we have a lot of intelligence information, we have a lot of, we have a lot of investment, we've got a lot of 
interest in the success of the sector. Mm -hmm. So we should be behind it saying, you know, no, we actually stand beside these guys because we really firmly believe in this and we don't think this is right and we can actually prove where it, there are some stresses and strains. Mm -hmm. So I think we could be better at that. Mm -hmm. um, with no disrespect to anybody who does that activity, but I think if we were maybe a bit more joined up and forceful, mm -hmm. then it could only do better. Mm -hmm. Having that kind of single unified voice. Yeah, because mm -hmm. the frustration is, and I've said this to a few people, the mm -hmm. care sector is probably one place where people, w people don't go on strike. Care workers won't go on strike. You can't. <laughs> Yeah. Like what would happen? No. I mean, it's just not, it's even, just not going to happen. It's inconceivable, isn't it? So actually, you could almost dismiss them mm. as a workforce that that doesn't really matter because they're still going to turn up to work. Mm. And you can't do that. Mm. Um, that's wrong. And that, that's where the whole disconnect seems to be mm -hmm. with the fact that social care is such a hard puzzle to solve. But there's been lots of iterations of how to do it and nobody's really grasped the nettle. Mm. Um, so I think I think there's work to be done there. I mean, we'll get. I think everybody's getting better, but I think we could probably muster. Yeah, muster arms. Better team effort. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh, can't argue with that. Exactly. Um, how important do you think culture, organisational culture, is to health and social care? Hugely. Hugely. Mm -hmm. I think if you if you don't have that right from the top, then the further down the tree you get, the, the impacts can be quite significant. Mm -hmm. So I think we've seen, certainly when I started, the absent owner. So nobody actually knows who they're working for. They're very mm -hmm. rarely seen in the organisation itself. Um, so there's no, there's no real culture to follow. Mm -hmm. The culture becomes whatever you make it. Sure. That's dangerous. Uh, that's when you end up with sort of factions and you need a strong leader mm -hmm. with a strong focus on culture. Yeah. But you need to be able to, that needs to be appropriate. Mm -hmm. That needs to be managed. So I think it's hugely, I think it's huge actually. I was at uh, a local, a local care um, sector awards sort of celebration for a, a single operator who's a, num who's a number of homes. Mm -hmm. I was at that event sure. on the Friday night, just to sit with all those staff, and and um, you know they they actually had some of the residents there as well who wanted to attend the oh wow the care awards, um, and they had family members mm -hmm. there as well. Fabulous! I did that. the The theme was really about the culture mm -hmm. of that whole group of people, and that came absolutely from the top. Mm. And you, you, you saw it in spades. And uh, it had quite an impact, actually. Mm. But the positivity and the, the drive from that was, was just throughout the whole thing. So I think in social care, it's just massive. Mm. Um, it's something we are very conscious of. We go into a business and you can kind of sense whether it's the right culture or not. You, mm. you, you definitely get that feeling and boy what a difference it makes when it's it's right mm. and you can certainly feel it if it's not definitely and I think it does impact on your decision making mm. and I suspect it probably impacts on ultimately how that business performs mm. um, I mean there's a lot of characters in the care sector but I think that's a good thing yeah because some of these characters actually drive that sort of culture mm. uh, and that, that, that has to be encouraged as well. So there is a balance, but yeah, I, I just think it's, it's, it's vitally important, as it is in any professional organisation that's mm. supplying that sector. So, you know, as I say to you, the culture of, of how you integrate two businesses with slightly different ways of looking at things, mm. um, but you then come up with a greater good, it's all about culture. Yeah. So uh, you get that wrong, you're in trouble. 
Very true. Mm. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because we, we, we talk about having a, a culture by design or a culture by default. Mm. Um, and you can put a lot of energy into designing your culture and making sure that people are turning up to work in the right way. And that could be everyone from the owner, director or CEO through to the frontline front, front, front line workforce. Um, but if you don't have uh, a certain amount of um, let's say expectation management around what the what the culture is what the values are what the uh, the behaviors are of the team what the what it means to, to to be striving towards the vision for the organization whatever it might be um, you're leaving yourself exposed because if you haven't if you haven't set those expectations to, to begin with then um, people aren't ultimately they're without having that expectation set, they're not going to know how to turn up to work. So they they, they might turn up um, and, and do everything that's expected of them in the manner that it's expected and to yeah. be able to do that in, a, in an engaged and energetic way, which is, again, living within the boundaries of the values and striving toward short, uh, to, to achieve the vision. But if they're not, then I guess the, the colloquialism is having people on the same page and pulling in the right direction. And if you haven't, then Ultimately, you're, you're leaving yourself exposed, and that means that from a uh, from the well-being of your team perspective, there's going to be issues. There just is. It's one of those things that's just an inevitability. From the perspective of your residents, because if the team aren't uh, all, mm. all on the same page, the, uh, the the residents or the uh, the, pe the kind of beneficiaries of the care are ultimately they're, they're not going to enjoy the best possible life experience. And all things being told, the business is probably going to be underperforming. As well, yes, and that's it's just downward spiral from yeah. from from there ultimately, isn't it? So yeah. it's um, it's something that we we're big on within SBMP, even within the uh, within the care home show. Uh, it's something that I spend an awful lot of time talking about, and uh, we see it as we're very much of the opinion that having a high performance culture um, is the most undervalued opportunity in businesses today, not least the care sector, because. I mean, if you look at the um, certainly the the the, uh, the Chloe's from the CQC's framework, the first handful of questions ask questions um, in the in the well-led domain around culture, mm. what's the vision, what are the values, what are the behaviours, yep. all of that type of stuff. So yep. and you how know is it evidenced the, yeah. exactly like yeah. if, the, if the regulator is saying this is really really important, yep. and you just think, oh well, no, it's all right, don't worry about it. We don't we don't need to design our, our culture. We don't have to, need to have that level of clarity and specificity. Then. If only from the regulator's perspective, then they're gonna they're gonna haul you they're gonna pull you over hot coals. But ultimately, the, the the regulator is there to uphold what should be happening within the organisation anyway, because ultimately that's gonna lead to a better led service mm. where the, the the people, both the uh, again the, the 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 teams and then the people that are, are involved in um, sorry the beneficiaries of the of the care, whatever that in what environment that might look like, they're they're gonna be compromised, and that's. That's not what it's all about. People deserve good quality care, and they deserve to be in an environment which, ultimately, that's going to be underpinned by by the culture. So, yeah, and they should be in that culture and actually thriving in that culture themselves mm. as residents. So they, they they should be part of it, contributing towards if not it, contributing to it exactly. One hundred percent, exactly. That's that's the key. So, if you were to give one person um, looking to make a positive impact on the on the uh, on the health and social care sector, a piece of advice. What would that one piece of advice be? That piece of advice would probably be do a lot of research and speak to people who do it, have done it, are involved in it, um, support it. You can never get enough knowledge. You, you, you need to really absorb as much as you can, hands on. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy game at all. It's a very difficult sector, no matter what segment you approach it in. Mm. And it, 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 it's difficult if you're on the other side of the table as well. You need to understand that. You need to understand the challenges of somebody with the needs and the, and the, and the, the wants. That's why they're, they're relying on the service. You need to, you need to, really, you need to really get that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, not a, it's not a make money quick exercise mm. I think some people still think it is and, and people are still investing in the sector as a sort of I do this and I'm going to buy a care home mm. and, I'm, and I'll keep that there and I'll just do this mm. I, I kind of wrestle with that one because I know how difficult that is Yeah. Um, and also as a social responsibility because if the people who are being cared for have a bad experience mm. talking from my own experience 
it has a huge impact on the rest of your life. Mm. If you're a young person, it certainly doesn't help your life if you're an older person. So you have a social responsibility to make sure that you're going to do that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of combination of things there that mean you need to be educated. Um, I mean, luck, luck is for the unprepared. You know, at the end of the day, you might need a little element of that, but you don't want to be relying on it. So uh, that would be my advice. Speak to as many people as you can. Get the right introductions mm -hmm. and spend the time. Spend the time. You know, some of our team spend time in a care home. Mm -hmm. They'll spend time as a, as a care worker. Mm -hmm. And they'll also experience what it's like to be a resident overnight. Mm -hmm. And all the noises and the, all the things that go on just to get a feel for what's that like. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that's what you need to do mm. if you're gonna if you're gonna enter the business. I've never heard um, your uh, the the quote that you made then. So luck is from the unprepared uh, for the unprepared. Sorry, yeah. that's uh, that's quite powerful. Did uh, is that a uh, is that a Derek quote or is that someone? No, that it's not a Derek. It won't be a Derek quote. I I um, I'm fascinated by psychology. Okay, and mental health. Mm -hmm. So I studied criminal psychology, and I like all that sort of. Um, that whole mental um, capability and challenge and mm -hmm. mental mental awareness. So I spend a lot of time reading and and exploring what can be found in that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you pick up little things like that that then sink in and make you th make you sort of learn. Uh, so so yeah, I I do I do quite a lot of that sort of stuff as an aside. Mm -hmm. You get funny looks in the train and the plane right enough when you're reading about some <laughs> of the psychopaths that are <laughs> that are in prisons and things, but it's a fascinating subject. Human psychology, we're, uh, we're strange animals ultimately. We are strange the animals. The more, um, the more that you can understand about humans, I think the, uh, the better off you're going to be as uh, making yeah. your journey as a human, so yeah. I can't argue with that for, for logic. So, yeah. um, What's the best piece of advice do you think that you've personally ever received? Best piece of advice. Um, bizarrely, when I started in the bank as a as a junior uh, employee in 1986, yes, 86, and I literally was in the old-fashioned bank branch with the uh, if the people watching this remember Captain Mannering. Uh, that was the type of guy I worked for, yeah. and I made the tea, and I had to go and get the newspaper, and I had to change the toilet rolls and go and get the coffee morning snacks and all these exciting things. Stamp checks, file check books. Um, and he used to give me wisdom. And he said to me one day that uh, if I was going to succeed in the bank, this is 86 remember, that I should um, remember one thing. And I said, right. So. He said, never lend money to a man who comes to see you in a suit with a beard wearing white socks. <laughs> and has that piece of advice put you in good stead so far? Do you know, here we are all these years later and it's still fresh in my head. <laughs> I have to say, I've not made it, I don't think I've ever met anybody that does that, but um, certainly if they walked in, I would, it would have an instant accord with me. <laughs> so whether that's the best advice, I, know, I don't know. I think my father... Uh, who is, has been a, a big counsel to me, he would say, um, be yourself. Um, yeah, be, be yourself and don't be, don't be frightened to be yourself. Mm -hmm. Good solid advice. Yeah. I can't think of any other better way to, uh, to end the, uh, the episode. So, Derek, it's been an absolute pleasure. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much Appreciate for having me on the, uh, the Care Home Show. Fantastic. Superb.